reflect on how great a God we do serve, and uh, it is a great privilege to be able to do that. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to the book of Joshua, chapter number 4. Joshua, chapter 4. And we're going to be kind of uh, in a few different places in the Scriptures this morning and uh, over the next few weeks looking at uh, a few different concepts. I've had the privilege uh, in my life and, and ministry to be able to travel around uh, to various churches. I would assume uh, I've probably preached, and I don't know the exact number, I've probably preached in uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 different churches. Uh, I've been able to visit uh, more than that, and I've uh, been able to, to observe and see things. And one of the things you'll find uh, as you travel this, this country is that there are a lot of churches like ours, at least in terms of, of doctrine and practice, churches that we would associate with and fellowship with, that uh, quite honestly are shrinking in size, that are filled with uh, older folks and gray heads and Listen, uh, if you're an older folk or a gray head here this morning, I don't want you to take that as an insult in, in any way. But I, I want you to know that I am very grateful that as I look across the congregation of Fargo Baptist Church, we have everyone from uh, infants in the nursery all the way on up to those who are in their latter years of life and, and every stage in between. I'm grateful for that. We've got a really good mixture of people. And sometimes we find that uh, when you've got some... Uh, uh, older folks in the church, that, that really is where your stability comes from. Uh, you've got wisdom, and you've got uh, a lot of times that's where a lot of the financial giving comes from. And I mean, it just the, the, the consistency and the faithfulness and the stability of a church is often in those who are a little more seasoned in age. And then the other side of that, though, is uh, a lot of times the uh, the energy and the zeal and, and, and a lot of the labor ends up coming from, from younger folks as well. And so when you're missing uh, an, an element like that, when you're very one-sided uh, when it comes to, uh, to age, especially if your uh, church is filled with older people but they're not reaching younger people, there's one thing you can look at and consider that church may not be around forever. And uh, I think it's a, a tragic thing that we are seeing churches that are kind of dying off, uh, n- not only figuratively, but even literally. And I, I see churches, honestly, that are, are losing membership just to, to, to old age and people passing away, and they're not reaching new people, and they're not reaching uh, uh, younger generations. And the generations of those who have come up from within that church have gone out elsewhere. And then I think we see another problem within our nation is that a lot of the younger people that have been raised in Bible preaching churches and Christian homes, uh, they have gone, if not gone totally to the world, they have uh, ended up in churches that uh, are more watered down, uh, more contemporary focused and more interested in entertainment, entertaining people than they are with preaching the Word of God. And uh, I think that's tragic and it's sad. And I think it's also sad that you have churches that in an attempt to keep younger people have lowered their standards, watered down the preaching, and taken, you know, uh, uh, tried to take a more uh, uh, unoffensive approach. Uh, they've kind of, kind of gone that seeker-sensitive way. And uh, I, I think that's tragic. And I just want to say, I, I think it's sad any time I see a church, uh, a, a Baptist church that takes the name uh, off the sign. We're not a Baptist church anymore. We're such and such a church. Sometimes they're doing us a favor, right, because we wouldn't want to be identified with them. But, but the reality is, you know, I'm not ashamed to be a Baptist. And, and I'm not a Baptist because it's a denomination. We're an independent church, but we are what we are because of what the Bible teaches. And we have no, I make no apology for that. And I, I think it's sad when, when folks do. And all I'm trying to get at this morning is that I think we're seeing uh, a trend within our nation of a departure from, from God, a departure from the, the truth of the Word of God, and, and an overall uh, worldliness and, and carnality that is beginning to creep in. And then I want you to consider history for uh, a few moments and, and 
uh, realize that the problem doesn't exist only in the United States. We just happen to be in, in a kind of a unique time period uh, as a culture. Because when you go over to Europe, you'll find that actually not that long ago, a matter of uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago, uh, there was a great work being done of the Lord uh, in Europe. And churches were, were starting all over the place and revival was breaking out and the word of God was being preached. And yet you go to Europe today and you find primarily a coldness in the hearts of people toward the gospel. Uh, atheism runs rampant throughout all of, uh, all of Europe. Uh, Islam is taking over parts of Europe. And it's very difficult. I, I've, I've dealt with people who've moved to uh, England and some of these places that they, they struggle to find a good Bible preaching church. And uh, that's a sad thing when you consider the history of where they once were. And uh, so what I'm trying to get at this morning is that we need to realize that what we have here in Fargo Baptist Church is not guaranteed to last forever. Now, I understand Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I believe that until the return of Christ, there will always be some Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches. Churches that are founded on the Word of God. Churches that are evangelistic and reaching the lost. But I want you to know that that guarantee doesn't last for each individual church. In fact, we find that churches have a life cycle. I mean, where is the church at Jerusalem today? Where is the church of Ephesus today? You know, where where is the church at Antioch today? Or Philippi, or any of the churches that you read about in the New Testament? In fact, I would challenge you to go and find a church that, for the last 200 years, has stood firm on the Word of God, has faithfully proclaimed the gospel, And remains today a scriptural church. Founded that way, remaining that way until today. It's very difficult to find. Now, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom this morning at all. But I do want to just wake us up to some reality here. Because uh, I believe that as a church, we're in a very unique phase. One of the things that impressed me most about Fargo Baptist Church when I came here in uh, 2006. Was that the church was filled with what we would call first-generation Christians. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about when I say first-generation Christian? Uh, those who, uh, they, they were not raised in a Christian home, they weren't raised in church, but they came to Christ maybe later in life, and they're the, really the first ones in their family to become Christians. And I hope you understand when we talk about second-generation, third-generation Christians, we're not saying that just because a person is born into a Christian home that they are a Christian. That, that's obviously not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, ye must be born again. A man must be born again. It's a personal uh, uh, issue. But here we are today in 2018, 31 years after the church was started, and we're finding... Uh, that a second generation is coming up. Younger folks who were born into a Christian home whose parents were not, but their parents got saved here, discipled here, and decided we're going to have a Christian home. And now we're seeing that second generation coming up, many of which have been saved and have a desire to serve the Lord. But I want you to recognize and understand that there is always a danger as a generation passes and another arises, there's a danger that that which was will be lost. And so I, I want to share with you over the next few weeks some things from Scripture about reaching the next generation and passing on the faith to the next generation. And I want to start here in Joshua, and uh, we'll begin in chapter 4 and verse number 1. The, uh, the Israelites have just crossed over the Jordan River and they're entering into the, the promised land, the land that God has promised for them. And it says in verse number 1, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, And ye shall carry them over with you, 
and leave them in the lodging place where he shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. And take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. And the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel, listen to this, forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the ark of the covenant stood, and there they are, uh, or, and there are they, uh, excuse me, and they are there until uh, unto this day. All right, now skip forward to uh, verse 19, if you would. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and encamped in Gilgal, in the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal, and he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you, until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. Listen to these words, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. I want you to notice that uh, as the Lord is leading his people into the land of promise, he gives them some specific instructions to set up these stones, these memorial stones, if you will, and to set them up as a memorial, as a a monument, to remind them of the work uh, that God had done among them. And the, the express purpose of setting up these stones was that the people of Israel would ultimately end up serving the Lord forever. That they would be able to look back and see what God had done for them and continue fearing the Lord, serving uh, Him forever. And I want to say to you, and it's very important that you get this down, whether you are uh, an an older uh, person here who's maybe been saved for many years, or if you are a, a young person, maybe just being raised in a Christian home, it's important for you to realize and understand that God's plan has always been that the people He redeems will serve Him forever from one generation and, and onward. And again, I, I want to reiterate and, and, and distinguish a little bit this morning. We're talking about a, a, a nation, the, the chosen people of God, Israel, uh, and we understand that you were part of that nation by birth. And you are not automatically a Christian by birth. Some people believe that, some people teach that, and, and, and I want to be very clear this morning in understanding you, you are not, you do not become a child of God because of who your parents are. In fact, uh, in the book of John, uh, in chapter 1, the Bible tells us that we're born, uh, born of God, born again, not of blood, that is, it's not of a bloodline. It's not just because you're raised in a Christian home or you're raised in church that automatically uh, you're on your way to heaven and you have a relationship with God. No, every individual for themselves must come to a point of understanding of their sin uh, uh, and, and recognition of their inability to save themselves and in repentance turn from their sin and in faith trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Every individual must do that. But I do believe that I, I would not be in any way... Uh, um, unfaithful to the scriptures by saying this morning, it is the will of God that the next generation that comes up behind us 
carries on the faith that we believe and preach today. I, I, I know that to be true because the Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So I can say without any uh, uh, fear of, of, of violating the scripture this morning, it is the will of God that our children and grandchildren would come to know Christ as Savior and serve him forever. It is his will. And I want you to know that that has been his plan from the beginning. When we read in the book of Exodus, I don't think we'll take the time to go there this morning, but Exodus chapter 12, when when God was bringing uh, the the Israelites out of Egypt, the very last plague that, that came upon the land of Egypt, if you remember, was that the firstborn in every house would be killed. The death angel would pass through and, and the firstborn would be killed. And God gave to the Israelites, and really to whoever would listen, uh, a, a way in which they would be protected from that plague. And uh, it was a wonderful picture of salvation as a lamb was to be slain. And the blood of that lamb was to be painted on the, uh, on the doorposts of the house. And as the angel of death passed over, as he saw the blood upon that house, he would, he would pass over. And, and what a wonderful picture of what God does for us, right? That though death passed upon all men, for that all have, saved, or all have sinned, that by the blood of Jesus Christ we're saved. And when the Lord looks on us and he sees the blood of his Son uh, upon our lives, he passes over. I'm, I'm so thankful that we don't have to fear judgment if we've been saved. But when God gave them uh, that, uh, uh, that pattern, if you will, uh, to shed the blood of that lamb and, and paint that blood on the posts of their doors and uh, to eat that uh, Passover lamb, he told them that they were to do this continually year by year as a memorial, as a memory of what God had done. And he said in Uh, In Exodus chapter 12, specifically, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. God's plan from the very beginning in bringing out a nation was that they would fear the Lord their God forever. And I think I can say uh, to you this morning, if you have been saved, if God has called you out of this world, He's called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, and you've passed from death unto life, it is His will for you and for your seed to serve Him forever. It's God's plan. It's God's will. And yet Jesus asked a question in Luke chapter 18 and verse number 8. He said, When the Son of Man cometh, shall He find faith on the earth? The question is, if the Lord doesn't return in your lifetime or in mine, will there come a a point in, in time, will there come a time when the next generation or the generation after them forsakes the truth that we stand on today, walks away from the Lord, goes and serves the gods of this world that are around them, Folks, it is a problem. It's not God's plan. It's not His desire. I think back to the mid-1700s, that time, that turning point in our nation, as our forefathers had come to this country, to this place, so that they could freely worship and serve God without having to submit to the Church of England and <clears throat> the oppression that they faced by uh, the, the King of England and that government and then the decision that was made, we're going to declare our independence. And in 1776, that Declaration of Independence was signed And we entered into a a war, we call it the Revolutionary War, in which many of our forefathers lost their lives for the sake of freedom. And I just go back in my mind to that time, obviously never having been there, but having read the history books, and, and I can't help but think, you know, to those people, freedom meant something. Freedom was so important they were willing to die for it. 
They were willing to give up everything they had so that others even coming behind them could experience true freedom. They didn't take for granted the freedom that we do today. And the reality is, folks, that there are things, and I know you and I could sit here and debate about how free we really are as a nation and all of that, but I want you to know there has never been a nation on the face of the earth that has experienced freedom as we have as Americans in the last 200 years. God has blessed, and I'm thankful for the price that's been paid. But I want you to know that the freedom that we experience today that was bought and paid for with the blood of patriots over the years, we take for granted. We take it for granted. In fact, this particular generation of young people has a mentality, not all of them, but many of them, have a mentality that America is really the great supervillain of history that everything about this country needs to be radically changed. And, uh, and, and you see uh, young people adopting socialistic ideas and, and uh, just all, all kinds of things that honestly would make our, our forefathers roll over in their graves. And this is not in any way a, a, a message or a lesson that is designed to say, listen, we need to you know, fight for freedom in America. That's not what this is at all. But what I'm trying to point out to you is that those who really not that long ago in this nation were willing to die for freedom, a generation, two generations, three generations later, now we're willing to turn back on everything that we have had and all the price and all the sacrifice that that has been made, now there are people who are willing to just turn around and go back. History isn't being communicated clearly. It's being clouded. and, And I'm just saying to you, it's amazing how one generation can believe something so ardently And the next generation, or the one after that, can totally go the opposite direction. And folks, I believe that it is the will of God that this church would be found faithful unto the coming of Christ. I believe that that is His desire. I prayed and asked the Lord, please don't allow my children, grandchildren, to walk away from the Lord. Make them faithful servants of the Lord. Help them to be closer to God than I am. May, may the next generation coming behind take on the, uh, uh, the, the commitment to Christ in a, in a greater way, in a deeper uh, way, and, and may they serve Him uh, greater than, than, than this generation has. I believe it's His desire. But there really is a problem, folks. The problem is, please listen, we cannot take for granted that our children will be faithful to the Lord just because we are. I want you to go with me to the book of Judges, chapter 2. Just because you love God does not mean that the next generation will. Just because we believe, preach, and practice truth as a church does not mean that the next generation will. And I want you to know that I believe that Satan would love to be able to take this church, which has been so mightily used of God over the years, to reach the lost and to send the light around the world of the gospel. He would love to take this church and make it one of his trophies to have the doors closed on this place or, or for, for false doctrine to creep in or carnality to, to begin to be accepted within. And in Judges chapter 2, after all that the Lord has done for the nation of Israel, the Bible says here in verse number 7, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, In all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel, and Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. 
And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Ares in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Do you, did you read that? It says in verse number 7, the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Verse number uh, 10, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. Here you have the people who experienced firsthand the mighty works of God, going before them, conquering nations, delivering them out of the hand of their enemy, giving them a land of promise, having seen some of them, no doubt, the oppression that they faced in Egypt and now having been brought out of that into a promised land. And the Bible says as long as that generation was around, Joshua and the elders that uh, even outlived him, as long as that generation was there, the people served the Lord. But when that generation passed on, when that generation died, there arose another generation. A generation which knew not the Lord. Now listen, this is totally contrary to what God had designed and planned for for Israel. It's contrary to what He had commanded Israel. But for, for some reason, somehow, a generation of people, the children and grandchildren of Great men of God like Joshua rose up, not even knowing the Lord. And the result was they forsook the Lord and they served Baal and Ashtaroth, false gods, pagan gods. They worshiped them. One generation. One generation. I don't know about you, that burdens me tremendously. It bothers me. One of the reasons that it bothers me is that I would be labeled by some a second generation Christian. Actually, technically, a third generation. On both sides, both my father's side and my mother's side of the family, my father's side of the family... His dad got saved and ended up, the the rest of the family ended up getting saved. My grandpa on my dad's side became a preacher. And uh, now some of my uncles on that side are are Baptist pastors as well. And so I'm a third generation Christian. Now, again, let me say that I had to be saved myself. And I had to make my walk with God personal. Personal. You can't just ride the the coattails of mom and dad. But on that side, I'm third generation, really third generation preacher, in a sense. On my mom's side of the family, my grandmother got saved back in the early 60s. And she ended up leading uh, her children to the Lord. And now, I had the benefit of being born into a home with... Listen, there was never a time in my life growing up where there was alcohol in my home. I think that's a blessing. There was never a time in my home uh, where there was any talk of or any fear of my parents splitting up and divorcing. I'm thankful for that. In fact, I've never seen my parents have an argument. You know that? I'm thankful for that. And we went to church faithfully. A church that preached the Bible a church where the gospel was proclaimed. I'm thankful for that. We prayed before meals. Uh, we would, uh, we would uh, get together with, with extended family, and a lot of times the conversation was about biblical things. I'm thankful for the home that I was raised in, but I want you to know there are some things that 
second and third generation Christians deal with that the first generation doesn't understand. And I'm not saying that to insult anyone in any way. I'm just saying it's important for you to understand as we seek to pass on the faith to the next generation. There are some things that our children and grandchildren will deal with being raised in the environment in which they're raised that we uh, uh, may not understand or that you may not understand. I said uh, several weeks ago in a message that one of the, the distinctions seems to be uh, in the, in the, the life of a first-generation Christian, the, when, when, when someone gets saved out of the world, there is a very distinct difference in the way that they behave, in the things that they do or don't do in their life. I mean, that change that the Bible speaks of is very evident when someone who's a drunk or a drug addict gets saved and God delivers them from that, do you think their life looks different? Yes, absolutely it does. The things that they used to be involved in, they no longer are. Praise God for that. But when someone who is raised in a Christian home gets saved, the life doesn't change that much. And when I say that, I'm not saying that there is no change because the change is an inward change. It's a heart change. It's an attitude change. There's something that changes in the heart. But listen, the same life is still being lived. I, I remember when I got saved, do you know what changed about my behavior? Well, I started going to church every Sunday. Nope, was already doing that. Well, I started to memorize scripture. No, I was already doing that too. Uh, you know, we started to pray and talk about the things of the Lord. No, I, I did all of that. But you know what? The thing that changed was internal. And here's the problem. Sometimes, when there is not a clear, evident contrast seen, it makes it easier for tares to blend in among the wheat. Do you know what I'm saying by that? Let, let me put it to you this way. Your children know how to look like good Christians. You know how I know that? Because I did too. And if you've heard my testimony, I'll try and share it with you here briefly. I was saved uh, in, uh, uh, as a child. I was saved at the age of six. You say, wow, that's pretty young. Yeah, it is. But you've got to remember... You, some of you remember the first time you heard the gospel. How many of you remember the first time you heard the gospel clearly? That's great. I don't remember that. Because I've been hearing the gospel clearly from the time I was a baby. I mean, really. By the time I could talk, I could, uh, the, the, probably the first song I learned to sing was Jesus Loves Me, you know? I mean, that's the way that, that, I, was, that I was raised. I... I, I Got saved at the age of six because I realized that the, the gospel wasn't just for everyone, but it was for me. I realized that I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. And I was born again at the age of six. And I can show you evidence in my life from that point forward that God dealt with me about different issues. And I know, I know that I was saved. It was about a year later that God called me to preach and clear as day. I remember it as clear as just about any other day in my life when God spoke to my heart through the preaching of the Word of God. And it was as if He said, and listen, I don't believe that God speaks to us in an audible voice, but it was as close to that as it could have been, okay? God, we were sitting in church on a Sunday night, believe it or not. Sitting in church on a Sunday night, we had a missionary in, uh, to the country of Chile, going to the country of Chile. And he was preaching. I don't remember exactly what he was preaching about, but he said something to the effect of, if God called you to go to Chile, would you go? And I'm telling you, as clear as I'm standing here today, it was as if the Holy Spirit said to me, would you go? And I said, Lord, I'll go. And I remember that night going down to the altar and telling the Lord, 
whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I'll serve you. If you want me to be a missionary, I'll be a missionary. If you want me to be a pastor, I'll be a pastor. And I'm telling you, I got up from that altar that night, walked back to my seat, knowing that God had called me to preach. It was a, a, a blessed time in my life. But you know, some time went on. And as I got a little bit older, there are just some things that you deal with. Being a kid, growing up in a Christian home, knowing the Bible, uh, being homeschooled. I was homeschooled. There are some things that I began to deal with in terms of curiosity about the things of the world. Wondering what was on the other side of that fence that I was never able to cross. Do you know what I mean by that? Just curious, I know mom and dad say that the world's not fun. I know the preacher says that, the, you know, that sin is only pleasurable for a season, but it sure looks like a good time to me. They seem to be enjoying it. And that coupled with this idea that I was okay because I knew what the Bible had to say, I, I was in church all the time, it, I never really developed a close personal walk with God. And so I began, especially in my early teen years, to be curious about the things of the world and dabbling in the things of the world and experimenting in the things of the world. And by the, by the time I was 15 or 16 years old, I was all in. I mean, I was all in. And I, you'd get me around my friends, my worldly friends, and I'm telling you, and I'm ashamed to say it, but many of my worldly friends had no idea that I was a Christian. I talked just like them. I acted just like them. I did the same things that they did. We joked about the same things. And you know what? As far as they were concerned, I was just a kid just like they were probably being raised in church maybe. But I wasn't a Christian. And on the other side of that was... When I was home with my family, they didn't know what was going on. When I was in church, listen, I was the good kid in church. I mean it. There was a time my pastor told me, I trust you more than I trust my own son. I remember him telling me that. And he was serious. And I thought to myself, huh, if you only knew. I was a good kid. I'm just telling you. I knew how to play the part. Now inwardly, I know the Holy Spirit was all over me. He was convicting me. And there were times that I would even say, Lord, I'm sorry for this. Help me to get it right. But I was still curious about the things of the world. And, and I don't have time to get into everything, but I'll, I'll just put it to you this way. I got so miserable playing the part of a Christian... But knowing inwardly that there were things between me and the Lord, I got so miserable that God, that God had to break me and He brought me to a point of absolute brokenness to the point where, where I didn't even know what I believed anymore and I just didn't even know if I was saved. And, and I began searching the Scriptures and crying out to God for myself. And, and I'm telling you, it was like, like God really got a hold of me. It was as though I became a first-generation Christian. In the third generation. And I say all of that just to simply say, listen, that's my testimony. I'm not saying that that's everyone. But listen, you cannot take for granted that just because your kids are being raised in church and just because they know the Bible verses and just because they can sing the Bible songs does not mean that they are right with God in their heart. You cannot just take for granted that they are going to grow up and serve God. I read the Bible and I find countless godly men who lost their kids. Joshua, apparently, because there arose a generation after him which knew not the Lord. I think of Eli, that priest that we find in the early part of 1 Samuel. A godly man whose sons did wickedly and ended up costing them the priesthood. Samuel himself, what a great prophet of the Lord Samuel was, a judge over Israel. And yet, when Samuel was coming to the point of dying, the Israelites said, listen, give us a king because we don't trust that your sons are godly enough to lead us. 
They're wicked. David lost almost all of his kids, as far as we can tell, with the exception of Solomon. But you know what? Solomon wasn't quite what his dad was either. And then Solomon lost Rehoboam. And certainly after Rehoboam, Hezekiah, what a great king he was. But his son didn't follow in his footsteps. Josiah, the same. I'm just saying we could, we could go on and on and on throughout the scriptures and say just because a man or a woman is godly and loves the Lord does not mean that the next generation automatically follows. It has to become personal for them. It has to become personal for them. Very briefly, I want you to go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 145. In Psalm 145, we find that the responsibility, though it's not guaranteed that the next generation will faithfully serve the Lord simply because we do, though it is not guaranteed, <clears throat> it is still our responsibility to pass on the faith. And as we get ahead into the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how we can pass the faith on to the next generation. But I want you to recognize that the responsibility here is in verse number 4 of Psalm 145. It says, One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. Do you know whose responsibility it is to make sure that the next generation is serving God? This generation. It's on us. It's on us to, 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 to do everything in our power to declare the works of the Lord, to pass on what He has done for us. I want you to go back to, Psalm, or to uh, Joshua 4 again, where we started, and we're, we're almost done here. But I just want to point out a couple of things for you. In Joshua chapter 4, Verse number 6 says this, that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And then skip down, if you would, please, to verse 21. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. He said, listen, as we set up these stones, these memorial stones, our intention is not just to make some kind of a statue, some kind of a remembrance of history. The express purpose of setting up these memorial stones in the river Jordan and on the bank of the river Jordan is so that we have a conversation piece. That when our children ask us in time to come, notice he doesn't say if your children ask. He says when they ask. He says there's going to come a time when you're walking down by the, 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 the Jordan River with your children and they're going to say, hey dad, you see those big, that big pile of stones over there? What's that all about? That that's when you take the opportunity to say, listen, let me tell you what God has done for us. And that, that you can tell them and teach them, use this as a teaching tool to show them that they are supposed to serve the Lord forever. That they are to be faithful to the Lord uh, uh, who's delivered them. I want you to know that our responsibility ought to be to, to pass on, to memorialize, if you will, what God has done for us. You know, I, I'm thankful, again, as I said, that I was raised in the home that I was raised in. And though I had my own issues and things that I had to, had to deal with, and I, I went down a road that I should have never gone down, 
I'm still thankful for the protections that God placed in my life. You know, I can look back to a time two generations before me when God stepped into our family and He changed the path that we were going as a family. I'm thankful that God stepped in and changed my direction even before I was ever born. God ordained and designed that I would be raised in a home where I didn't have all of the worldly and ungodly influences that so much of the world does. I'm thankful for that. And you know, I can look back to that and point to it. And though the work of God had to be personal in my life, sometimes the memorials remind me that God's been working in my life since long before I was saved. And I think it's important that we point back to that. Listen, Christian friend, you ought to tell God, uh, your children what God has done for you and what He's done for them by extension. You ought to memorialize what He's done in your life. And then it's important that we raise our children to fear and love and serve God. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that if we train up a child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, the Lord gives us uh, specific instructions on how we are to teach uh, the next generation the Word of God. And then let me say this also very quickly. It's important as we seek to pass on the faith to the next generation that we are committed to evangelism. It is absolutely important, it is vital that we are reaching not just our children and grandchildren, but that we are reaching the world. Let me tell you this, if, if a church is not winning the lost, that church is dying. We must be committed to do as we're commanded in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. We must be committed to going out and reaching the lost of this world, winning them to Christ, bringing them into the church, grounding them in the faith, and teaching them to reproduce. Because if we're not reproducing, we're dying. We must be committed to evangelizing. We must be committed to investing in this generation, this next generation that is coming up and reminding them of all that God has done for us. And friends, can I just ask you and plead with you, pray for this generation. Pray for them. It seems that each generation faces new challenges. And there are things that your kids are dealing with in their schools or in the neighborhood or whatever influences that you didn't have to deal with. I, I read a, a statement um, just a few days ago that now over 50%, I think it was in, in the low 50s, 51, 52% of young, that is under the age of 30, young evangelicals now believe that same-sex marriage is okay. Can you imagine that? Folks, listen. The things that our children will face and our grandchildren will face, we ought to be praying for them every day. We ought to be praying that God gets a hold of their hearts and that they choose to serve and love God, that they develop a close personal relationship with God, not just riding mom and dad's coattails, because that won't last. We don't want a generation to come up not knowing the 